Good morning. Since I have an extra minute here, I want to say something about Kirsten. When she came into my office, I hope you remember this, part of her, she was trying to convince me, and the very end of it was, well, I used to help out with the Wheaton Academy football team. I'm sure I can handle your guys. <laughs> and she did well. She did well. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, 14 reads, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, let all you do be done in love. This was a verse we adopted for our spring break mission trips this year. I would love to break these verses down. I'll save that for the next time I'm, I'm invited, Dr. Blackman. What I would like to point out is that it's not just talking to men, but rather it's instructional to all Christians telling us to be active, on the move, and intentional as we strive to be Christ-like. There are several key factors needed to rally individuals as a group who will work and serve a greater cause, bigger than oneself. And briefly, the two words I want to focus on are accountability and vulnerability. Imagine what a family, a team, a church, our campus could do moving together passionately to add to Christ's kingdom if we worked on just these two words together. To be held accountable and not afraid to be vulnerable together as Christians is being intentional towards growth of Christ-like character. I want my guys to be included in the elite, as the mighty men of Gad were for King David. They were all in. Or the determination of the friends of the paralyzed man blocked by the crowd to get to Jesus. Instead, they went upstairs to the roof, ripping through it to get to the crowd, to get down from the crowd so he could be healed by Jesus. They were all in. I want my guys, our campus, to have that same resolve to be great husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, and to have that strength of character and integrity in your profession that shines the light of Jesus in the world, in the darkness of the world today. This investment is necessary together because each one of us is broken. We need the accountability, the discipline, the focus, and determination in our spiritual journey because none of us is without sin. It has been said that if you haven't gone head to head with Satan lately, maybe you're going in the same direction. When we're broken, poor choices, mistakes take a toll and there's consequences. Have someone that will hold you accountable in your life. You must have that. And you must also want to be held to that standard of accountability. You need to want that someone who will be intentional and honest in your life. My last year of football in 1980, there were 10 of us seniors left that played for four years together. Marty Thayer was one of them. He came in as an intense freshman, highly competitive. Nobody was going to outwork, Mar outwork Marty. I'm sitting in the stoop one morning and Marty comes in and sits across from me and looks me square in the eyes and he says, how is your relationship with Jesus today? It was this intentional care for his friends and his teammates that made an impression. I went to his memorial service a few weeks ago. This was a tough service for me. Not because we had spent a lot of time with each other after graduation or that we were best friends, but because when it mattered, we invested in each other over those four years. I want to share some stories that give insight to being vulnerable and accountable, accountable to each other over the 17 years of our trip so far. I also want to challenge you that if you have not taken advantage of the many opportunities here at Wheaton, you must before you leave. Two goals of ours is to partner with a former player uh, that are in the ministry or mission field. And the second is, I always pray that stuff happens when we're on our trips, barring injury, so you can see it's about God and not us. In 2007, we went to the village of Laskop, South Africa. J.D. and Barb Borgman helped manage an orphanage called The Cottages, a home for children whose parents died of AIDS. The first day on site, J.D. was showing us around the property and what that work would look like. One of, the play, uh, sorry, one of the children of 24, his name was Quinelli, age four, came up to one of the guys with his arms outstretched, just wanting to be held. One of the players picked him up as we walked around the site. 
When it was time to start work, the player tried to put Quinelli down, only to be grabbed and squeezed harder and screaming, not wanting to be let down. You see, Quinelli was HIV positive and had a lung infection that was so severe that when he breathed, it was merely a wheeze. The player lost the battle and continued to hold him. And that day, the next three years that we visited, the players decided that they would always hold, well, one would always hold them while all the others worked throughout the whole week. There was no guarantee that he would be around next year with his physical ailments. And the players just wanted to show him comfort and a warm body. The second story is one I've titled, It Just Doesn't Make Sense, Only God. At the edge of Santiago in Dominican Republic, there's a place called The Hole. It is just that, a valley that measures about a mile by a mile by about a quarter mile deep, and it looks as though a huge bowling ball just fell and left that impression. In this hole, there's 400 homes, some concrete, uh, some concrete, mostly shacks made from sticks and boards. As you walk the stairs down into the hole, there is this putrid, rotten smell rising from the garbage-filled stream home to pigs that meanders through the hole. The hillsides are filled with garbage dumped by the city over the edge. It is known that if you are born in the hole, you will always be in the hole. You see, it's made up of prostitutes and drug dealers. A man started going down into the hole to talk and share over the weeks, developing relationships with the people down in the hole. And one day, some men came up to him, covered, him, covered his head, and led him away. When the hood came off, he was standing in front of the boss who controlled the hole. There was a gun on the desk. The boss asked him, by the way, this man was a pastor, what are you doing in the hole? The pastor said, well, God told me to go start a church and a school for these people in the hole. The boss leaned back and said, that's it? That's all you want to do? No ulterior motive. Let's do it. The boss said, I like this idea of a church and a school. And not only that, if anyone harasses you, gives you any trouble, as he looked at his henchmen, so we've got your back, we'll take care of them. So as I thought about this pastor's testimony, I came to the conclusion, this just doesn't make any sense. You see, as the pastor leads people to Jesus and through the school educates children, the boss is losing revenue. Only God can choreograph a story like that. This is a journey entry from uh, one of our former leaders on a trip, Don Parrish, in Romania. Lord, you have an appointment for me. Help me impact my team. I am willing. Use me. The job, replace a sewer line at an orphanage 90% clogged, 60 foot long, three, three and a half foot wide, and four feet deep under an asphalt parking lot. I would line up any day with this group as we work. They never complained, won't quit, served with excellence. They're exhausted, sore, bruised, and yet satisfied. Lord, tomorrow as we get into the sewer line, open my eyes that I would meet you. Thank you for redeeming the junk in my life. The devotion today in Psalms 41 through 3 read, we are like pieces of gold that have fallen into the sewer. And Jesus trudged through it looking for us and pulled us out and cleaned us off. As I lifted the sludge to break into the old concrete line full of raw sewage, I thought, this is where my Savior went for me. Not even a good man, but an enemy. The sewage splattered my face and the guys began to dry heat from the stench. Jesus, your love overwhelms me. We removed the entire line, lifting the broken pieces over our heads to get it into the truck. Sewage poured all over us. My sin poured onto Jesus, holy, pure. How terrible the stench of sin was to him. Day four, the trench was empty, ready for new pipe, but first we needed to break through to the main line. And as we did, all the sewage from all the other lines poured into our trench. My sin not only affects me, but everybody around me. So much decay and death in this world. We shoveled, we used buckets, and we stood in it up to our knees. Thank you, Jesus. My life is not my own. Drew and I were working side by side 
with shovels getting the last bit out when he reached down and he pulled out an eight-inch spike that was in the pipe. Jesus said, this is how much I love you. I did what you couldn't. I exchanged all your sin for my righteousness. I took out a heart of stone and I gave you a heart of flesh. You are new and my spirit flows in and through you. Drew, does it matter what Jesus calls us to do? Is there anything that you wouldn't give? That night we gathered in the basement of an old church and the spirit nudged me to tell this story and read how Jesus was mocked, spit upon, flogged, beaten, and nailed to a cross. I leaned over and I slid that spike across the floor to the center of the circle and asked, is serving Christ worth it? What's the cost? Men, what can ever compare to what he has done for you? Jesus held nothing back. The sweetest worship happened all around me that night. Some on their knees, others standing with arms, raised. Some broke out in song. This was holy ground. This year, every location and group has their specific stories. Ask them to share those stories with you. But I want to tell you the most prevalent theme that came from these past trips was about how each other shared their lives with each other, how each was put on the hot seat for five minutes of questions, and how each group circled up praying in joy, encouragement, and in tears for each other. One person in conversation told me the first chapel back, she almost put her arms around those on either side of her when praying because that's what the group did all week together, arm in arm. When was the last time you or a friend looked each other square in the eyes and asked, how is your relationship with Jesus today? When you invest in someone by telling them you love them, you are committing to that person that you will be part of their life. See, love is an attitude that reveals itself in action. In Jim Elliott's story, he is quoted famously, Wherever you are, be all there. Live to the hilt in every situation you believe to be the will of God. I have shortened that when I sign off on letters. Live like it matters. Thank you.